Hello people, welcome to the answers for your diagnostic topic test two. We're going to go through these um, reasonably quickly because most of them uh, in order, most of them would be an insult to your intelligence if I went through them in great detail, especially the first few questions. Um, but there are a few things that are, that are worth understanding, so I want to, want to make sure that, uh, that you understand why some of the answers are what they are. All right. Question one, really easy insult to your intelligence. Find the, find the radius, <clears throat> excuse me, find the radius of the, of the International Space Station's orbit, radius of Earth, plus the 400 or so kilometres above the Earth that the, that the space station is. Add those two together, easy. Right. Part B, find the gravitational field strength of the Earth at the position of the International Space Station in its orbital. Well, the formula for gravitational field strength that's the strength of G, right, which does change as you go away from Earth. GM divided by R squared. That's pretty easy as well. Um, universal constant of gravitation. The M is the mass of the thing in the middle. It's not the mass of the thing going around. Right? So that's the mass of the Earth divided by R squared. Um, the only way you're going to get this wrong is either forget the formula or use the wrong units. Right? Um, so this has to be in meters, right? Got to get the units right. If you put that in kilometers, you're going to be out by a factor of a million. The answer is 8.68. Um, so it's uh, it's 9.8 meters per second squared at the surface. It's a little bit less further out. And it gets less and less and less. And eventually, of course, you don't fall back to Earth if you get far enough away. Part C. <clears throat> so determine the weight of the International Space Station at its position in orbit about the Earth. All right. Now it's weight, to find out how, well the, the weight is the force of something that's being attracted by another body. And gravitational force is this G M1 M2 on R squared. This is if you know the mass of both bodies. And, uh, and it's a mutual force. The Earth is attracting the satellite with that force and the satellite is attracting the Earth with that force, right? Of course, obviously, the satellite doesn't make the Earth move because the satellite's really small and the Earth's really big. The Earth has a lot more inertia, so nothing happens to the Earth because of this force. Um, but things mutually attract each other. When I jump up to the up into the air, I fall back down to Earth for two reasons. Firstly, the Earth is attracting me. And secondly, I'm attracting the Earth. The Earth is falling up towards me a tiny, tiny little bit. So let's see. Again, got to use the right units. Kilograms, meters it'll work. You end up getting 3.64 by 10 to the 6 newtons. Now there's another way to do that by the way. Right? Because weight is just mg, right? that's from f equals ma, and you've got the mass of the International Space Station and you've got the g where the space station is now because you, you answer part b. So the mass of the space station times 8.68, that will get you the same answer. So there is a shorter way to do that one. All right. <clears throat> D, determine the period of the International Space Station. Well, for period, you need to use Kepler's third law. I'm just turning a page here. Just looking at the question. Yeah. So Kepler's third law for D, change of color. R cubed divided by T squared equals, whoops, GM divided by 4 pi squared. This whole thing is a constant, because the mass of the Earth is constant, mass of, uh, oh, sorry, G is constant, 4 pi squared is a constant, so that is the same number for anything going around Earth. So if you know the radius of something, you know how long it's going to take. Everything that is at the same radius as the International Space Station takes the same amount of time to go around Earth. That's the sort of the meaning of this formula, right? Um, and this works, and this works for any um, bunch of objects going around something because of gravity. Right? So if you put the sun's mass in there, you can figure out um, the period of all of the planets around around the sun if you know their radius, or vice versa. And the answer comes around, comes out to 92.5 minutes. Again, the units will fool a few people. That's in meters, that's in seconds. Right? So you can't say, you can't put it in years or anything like that. If you, if you have to put a period into one of these things and they say, 
Earth takes one year to go around the sun, find the radius of Earth around the sun, you need to put Earth's period of rotation in seconds, not years. You won't, don't put one year, don't put 365 days. It's got to be converted to seconds. Right? But apart from that, pretty easy. And if you got five, 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 three point one four seconds and then converted that to minutes, you should have got about 92 and a half minutes. Right. Worth checking that you can drive your calculator to get those questions. Okay. Part E. This is an, a more interesting question. Part A, it says astronauts in the International Space Station float as they live and work. They experience weightlessness during their time in the craft. Explain why they're weightless during this time. In your answer, make reference to the terms weight and normal reaction. Okay. Well, they experience weightlessness. They feel weightless, but they're not weightless. Of course, they have weight. Now, I'm going to make this a little bit more long-winded than it needs to be, but I want you to understand the situation here. If you're on Earth, there you go, there's us walking along Earth, you feel your weight. You feel your weight because the Earth is pushing up on you. I'm going to draw, draw a hole there that you're going to fall into. We'll get to there in a minute. But at the moment, on Earth, you do have weight. You do have that weight falling down. But the only reason you feel it is because the normal reaction is pushing you up. You feel your feet squishing a little bit in your shoes. You feel that your hair is sitting down on your shoulders, perhaps. You feel that your arms, excuse me, your arms are being sort of drawn towards the earth. They're hanging off your shoulders. But you feel all those things. You don't concentrate on them because you feel them all the time. So it's a very natural feeling. So you're so used to it that you don't even take any notice of it. But that's what you feel and that's how you know that you weigh something. If you fall into a hole, while you're falling, you still have weight, obviously. That's the reason you're falling, right? There is a force pulling you down there, accelerating you towards your certain death, but you won't feel it. Your hair won't be sitting on your shoulders. It'll be sort of flying around, right? The blood in your feet won't be concentrated into your feet anymore. When you're standing, um, your blood rushes to your feet. Now, you don't notice it. When you're hanging upside down on a monkey bar or something, you really feel the blood rush into your head because you're not used to it when you hang upside down because you very rarely hang upside down. Most people don't do it. Right? But when you're, when you're standing up, um, the blood rushes to your feet because that's where gravity pulls it. Right? Your heart has quite a, a problem. It has to use quite a bit of power to pump your blood up to your brain. That's why when you faint, the best way to come to again is for, is for somebody to you know, leave you lying down and raise your feet a little bit because that tilts your blood back down into your brain and you, get, and you wake up again. So this person has weight but isn't feeling it. So of course they have weight. Now this is just a closer to earth version of the International Space Station because here's the International Space Station and an astronaut. I'm going to draw a better picture than this. <laughs> But the space station and the astronaut are both falling at the same time. Let me do a little bit. There you go. Now, there's a famous picture that's been drawn. And I'm not drawing it well. Because that's a really bad circle. Okay. I'm going to make a really really simple drawing. That's the space station, and here is an astronaut. Now, the reason that the astronauts don't feel their weight is because they can't stand on the ground of the space station. But it has it has no floor that they end up standing on, and the reason for that is that they are both falling towards Earth at the same time. The International Space Station is falling to Earth. The astronaut is falling to Earth, right? So it's a bit like it's a bit like somebody in an elevator and the cable from the elevator breaks and the elevator starts falling down the elevator shaft. You wouldn't be standing on the ground of the elevator in that case. 
because you and the elevator would be falling at the same pace and you would feel weightlessness and a lot of fear. Now, the reason that this doesn't hit Earth is because it is traveling so fast that way that it actually misses the Earth. Right? Instead of falling straight down, if I throw something, it lands a little bit of the way around the Earth. If I'm standing on Earth and I throw something, it lands a little bit of the way around the Earth. If I throw something harder, it lands a little bit further around Earth, right? a tiny, tiny fraction because I'm not much of a throw. But Isaac Newton correctly reasoned that there must be a speed at which you could throw something and it would just go all the way around Earth and try to fall but never quite hit it because the Earth is the right size for the speed of the throw and it would just keep on coming around it would hit you in the back of the head eventually. And he was right. And we have got the International Space Station going around the Earth at the right speed for that to happen. So it's constantly trying to fall but going that way and it ends up doing this. It just ends up going around the world. So the International Space Station and the astronauts inside it are all falling at the same time, but never landing. And because they're falling, nothing is holding that up. Nothing is holding that up. So the astronaut doesn't ever end up standing on a hard surface and feeling a normal reaction. That's why they feel weightlessness. They're not weightless. They have plenty of weight. And it's causing them to fall, but they never feel the normal reaction. Your apparent weight is the normal reaction on your body, and the astronauts don't have one. Question two. Okay, this is about the right-hand screw rule. And this is, this is a difficult question for a lot of people because it doesn't really involve calculations. It involves explaining things. Um, so I'm just going to go through this one in, in a bit of detail, not quite as much detail as that last question. But... There are two versions of this rule here, the right-hand screw rule. Right? One of them is for if you have a wire. Let me just draw a wire here. There you go. And this current going this way. And keep in mind, this is for conventional current. If they say specifically electron flow, you need to use your left hand. Right? But conventional current is that fake current that involves positives moving in the other way uh, when, when we really know that what's going on is electrons are moving that way. Right? But if they just say current, you have to assume conventional current. So we're pretending that positive char charges are going that way. So use your right hand. Right? And the right hand screw rule basically says that if there is a current going that way, you point your thumb in the direction of the current and your fingers will curl around the wire in the direction that the wire's magnetic field goes. Right. So at the moment, my fingers will be coming out of the page above the wire and into the page below the wire. And it's almost impossible to draw. So you just write these symbols for coming out of the page and going into the page. And that's the best way you can do it. Now, if you curl that into a circle, and like I said, there is a faster way to do this. But I need to show you the slow way because you, get, you tend to get taught the slow way. So I'm just going to draw a big circle here. Right. So if this is a wire carrying charge in a circle, and the charge is going this way, it's going anti-clockwise. Using the right-hand screw rule, you can find that in this part of the charge, in this part of the circle, current is going up. So the magnetic field made is going out of the page on the inside of the circle and into the page on the outside of the circle. Out of the page, into the page. And you'd find that everywhere. I'm going to need to break my wrist to do the rest of this, but thumb there, fingers coming out of the page on the inside. Thumb there, fingers coming out of the page on the inside. Same there. So you would find this. So if this was a tube, much like that tube, you would have a magnetic field on the inside that is belting from one end of the tube to the other. Right? Now, turning this whole picture sideways, you end up getting something like this, with a magnetic field coming out of the tube that way. Now, that's a little bit difficult to do, but luckily this 
this rule works backwards as well. This is very handy. If you curl your fingers around one of these coils in the direction that the current is going, and the current is going up on the back of the coil where we can't see it, and down at the front, right? So if I have my fingers up and wrapping around the coil like that, so they're coming down at the front where I can see them, right? Not like this. So if your fingers follow the current, right, only if it's coiled wire, only if it's a coil wire, this works. Your thumb actually points in the direction of the magnetic field inside the tube. Right? So you can, instead of doing all this garbage, instead of doing all that rigmarole, you can just reverse the rule and go, that's it. Right? So this one has a magnetic field that is going that way on the inside. Now, a lot of people get that right, but get the next thing wrong. They call that the South Pole because magnetic field lines go from north to south. Well, that's true on the outside of a magnet, but it's not true on the inside of a magnet. So let me just show you this. You've seen this before, seen this a dozen times before. <clears throat> In fact, I'll put it this way. Magnetic field lines go away from north, they go towards south, they go from north to south, right? But that's on the outside of the magnet. These things continue on the inside, and on the inside of the magnet, they're doing this. They're going from south to north. So that biomagnet is literally being made, or its magnetic field is literally being made by this tube. Right? And that's the inside of the tube, just like that's the inside of the magnet. And on the inside of the magnet and the tube, they go from south to north. So that's the north pole. Right? That's a south, that's a north. And because this is the same thing, that will be the south pole of that one, and that will be a north. So there'll be another magnetic field doing this. So at A, north to south, we're on the outside now, right? On the outside of what's making the magnetic field, it's back to normal. Magnetic field lines go north to south. So at point A, there will be a magnetic field going from left to right, right? So the direction of the magnetic field lines, and that's what the question specifically asked, is to the right in part A. I said, draw the magnetic field vector at point A. So you just draw arrowhead. Explain how you arrived at your answer to part A. Let's say you use the right-hand screw rule. Curl your fingers around the, the direction of the current and the thumb points from south to north on the inside of the coil. And you did that for both coils. And you reasoned that between the two coils, there was a north to a south and that the magnetic field lines would be going from north to south. That's the explanation. Okay. Now, part C, explain the effect on your answer to part A if one of the coils was rotated through 180 degrees. Now, at the start of this thing, it said two coils of uniformly wound wire. They're both, both coils have the same positive DC current running through them, right? So they have the same current. They're the same coils. They'll have the same magnetic field strength. So if you pick one of these up and reverse it, these lines are now going the other way they will be equal and opposite, so they'll actually be cancelling each other out, right? So there'll be, <clears throat> there will be a north pole there and a north pole there because that north pole is going to be on this side because we've turned the whole thing around. So the overall magnetic field strength here will be zero. So there will either be um, one going from north, one going from north there, and they'll be cancelling each other out, or they'll basically never get there. Right, so A will feel no magnetic pull one direction or the other. All right. Part D, explain the effect on your answer to part A. Keep in mind we're going back to A now, right? So they're, they're returned to this drawing. We haven't reversed this now. On your answer to part A, if the current in one of the coils decreased. All right. <clears throat> If the current in this coil, for example, is decreased, the magnetic field strength in this coil will be decreased. It'll still be the same polarity. I'll still have a south there and a north there. So the magnetic field lines will still be pointing that way. So A will still be feeling magnetic, a magnetic field pulling that way, right? Um, this one will have a magnetic field strength pulling that way, and this one will have a lesser magnetic field strength, but still pulling the same way. Right. So the magnetic field strength at A is going to be less, but it's going to be pointing in the same direction. That's all you had to say.
That's question two.